Well, as he said, uh, this is your last chance. If you want to get up and go to the alternative service in the FLC, it's going to get a little uncomfortable this morning, so I hope that you are ready and prepared for that. Uh, And we are going to be talking about sex, and it is something that unfortunately in the church becomes a dirty little secret that isn't often discussed. Uh, Our teenagers will learn about it in school when they're in the fifth grade, but a lot of parents, and rightfully so, are hesitant to let people teach their kids about sex. Young adults, uh, even old adults, I mean, everybody gets a little uncomfortable when we deal with the subject of sex, but that is what we're going to be talking about this morning in our third sermon series on questions you don't ask in church. If you remember, the first sermon, we talked about doubt and how God can walk along with our doubt if we question certain things about Christianity, but ultimately the real importance of discovering the answers and and finding out what God wants to teach us about doubt and through doubt. And then the second sermon that was last Sunday dealt with suffering and how God walks through our suffering with us and how our suffering can actually draw us closer to the Lord and bring us back to God. And if you think about it, Really, how do people respond to suffering? Well, I think one of the things that people do is they cry out to God. They draw near to God through that experience. But other people find different avenues to try to sympathize and heal their suffering. And one of the ways that they do that is sex. They experiment sexually. Uh, Other people, and what we're going to be talking about next week, will maybe turn to substances and, and fall into the trap of substance abuse. And, and so next week we are going to be talking about alcohol. But this morning uh, we are going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, so if you have your Bibles and you want to turn there. And we are really going to be dealing with this main idea of this, that every single person in this room, all of us, must strive for godly honor and purity in our sexuality. And we can really do that through four different ways. Number one is we need to respect our sexuality. Number two, we need to reject the lies of sex that's in our culture. Number three, we need to remember that sexual disobedience can lead to disbelief. But number four, and I would say most importantly, we need to always remind ourselves that God restores sinners. And we all sin, even me. We all fall short. And so if we can remember those four things, respect, reject, remember, and restore, we will be on our ways to pursuing an honorable and pure sexual relationship uh, with the Lord. Many of you probably heard uh, that Hugh Hefner had passed away this week. Hugh Hefner ushered in kind of an era of, of sexuality, um, and he really served as kind of a staple or a, a building block of our culture and the um, deterioration of, of what sex really means. And unfortunately, you know, I, I agree with God. Ezekiel says God doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. And so I don't celebrate his death this morning, but I do celebrate an end of an era, so to speak. I am happy that the, the head point and the focal of that type of sexual sin has no longer been around for the last few days. And it's important for us to get rid of those things. And so this man is most likely not with the Lord, not present with God, and he has the most real perspective you could ever have on sexuality. And so he's probably replaying and recalling all of the ways that he went wrong and all of the sins that he committed and caused in his sexual deviation from the Lord. But I myself was captive to a man like Hugh Hefner. When I was in the fifth grade, my first experience with Playboy magazine or seeing a, a sexual image was found on a computer screen. I was walking to my friend's house in elementary school, fifth grade, 10, 11 years old, and that would mark the beginning point in my life that I would struggle through my teenage years, even into my early young adult years with pornography. Pornography is a very dark and deadly sin, and we have to be aware of pornography and the impact that can have on our own life. But I was ashamed. I was ashamed because I knew I wasn't really following God's path. I knew I really wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. But as I grew older and as I began to be aware that looking at pornography and celebrating that type of sin really supported things like sex slavery. Whether or not you you know that, it, it supports sex slavery. A lot of the women that are involved in pornography don't do it because they want to. They do it because they have to or they are forced to because of their social situation. 
And so we have to be aware of certain dangers in our sexual culture. Social media and news and movies and video games are all bombarded with this idea of sexual sin. It wages war against our heart. It wages war against our mind. It violates our marriages. It corrupts our childhoods. And it's something that we as a church really need to fight against, not only personally, but also corporately. You know, I was listening to a radio advertisement just a few days ago, and it was an advertisement about building a deck, right? This guy was a deck builder. And we've become so destroyed as a culture that he actually had a play on words. The the word deck, to, to build decks, was substituted as a part of the male body part. I mean, isn't that jacked up? Isn't that sick? I mean, how messed up are we as a culture to where we advertise a construction worker building something for your personal home, but it's got to be defiled with this idea of of sex and dirty sex at that. I mean, it's just so, so messed up that we live in that type of culture, that our children are raised in that type of culture. Let me give you a few statistics on pornography. Pornography is a $13 billion industry. 24% of smartphone owners admit to having pornographic material on their phone. That means one and out of every four people in this room have some form of porn on their phone. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women struggle with pornography. Interestingly enough, self-described fundamentalists, and I think of people like the Westboro Baptist, have a 91% more uh, likely to look at porn than somebody who isn't a self-described fundamentalist. Nine out of every ten boys are exposed to porn before the age of 18, and six out of every ten girls. 67% of young men and 49% of young women say viewing porn is an acceptable way to express one's sexuality. 68% of divorce cases involve one party uh, meeting someone over the internet. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And 56% of divorce cases are involved where one of the members are heavily addicted to porn. And this is is a statistic that really blew my mind. 70% of wives of sex addicts, people who are married to men who are addicted to pornography and sex, could be diagnosed with PTSD. Think about that. It really damages women. The U.S. Department of Justice said this, never before in history of telecommunications media in the United States has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accessible by so many minors in so many American homes with so few restrictions. And so this morning I bring to you a a very unfortunate truth is that our culture, our minds are corrupted with dirty sex with things that should not take place in the minds of believers. And so we are going against our very own design that God has given us. I'd like to read to you from two medical doctors. They say this, It appears that the most up-to-date research suggests that most humans are designed to be sexually monogamous with one mate for life. This information also shows us that the further individuals deviate from this behavior, the more problems they encounter whether it be STDs, non-marital pregnancy, or emotional problems, including a damaged ability to develop healthy connections with others, including future spouses. And so we have our culture in one sense saying there is nothing wrong with porn, there is nothing wrong with dirty sex, there is nothing wrong with our sexuality and our sexual freedom. And then you've got the Bible which teaches a totally different message on sex, that it is something that should be celebrated and rejoiced but in the right context and in the right way. You've got science showing how this dirty sex really destroys us as a culture. It really hurts us in the end. But then you have science telling us and showing us the truth that we are designed for a certain way to operate and function. And so on one side we have reason, and on the other side we have passion. And so what does the Bible teach about sex? Well, here we have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 3, Paul writes this. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all of those who commit such sins, 
And as I told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so God has a purpose for your life. Have you ever asked yourself, God, what do you want me to do? What is your will for me? Well, first and foremost, it is to be sexually pure, to avoid sexual immorality. And so how should we be sanctified, which means to be set apart to be holy? Well, we should be sanctified in this, avoid sexual immorality. And so it's to be in a state of mental and physical uh, purity, to be in a state of holiness, to where you avoid the dirty and the impure and you relish in the sanctified and the design that God has given all of us to exercise our sexual freedom. Now let me run down a list of sexual moralities that the Bible talks about. The first one is fornication. This is sex outside of marriage. God never designed our world to operate in which we are like animals. We just have sex with whoever or even in an unmarried state. Adultery is a sexual sin. This is sex outside of marriage. So if you are a married individual, going outside of a sexual relationship, outside of your wife or your husband, is a sexual sin. Homosexuality is clearly listed in the Bible as a sin. This is someone who participates in sex with someone of the same sex as they are, whether a man with a man or a woman with a woman. Pornography. The Greek word is pornea. It's where we get our word pornography. This is basically playing mental and sexual images in your own mind with yourself as the star player. How about this one? Taking sexual hostage. And some of you who are in this room may have experience with this. Either your husband or your wife deprives you of sex because they're holding you hostage in order to gain something that they want or in order to punish the other individual. I'm not having sex with you because you did X to me, or you haven't done this for me. And we will talk about being a, being a sexual hostage later on. Bestiality, sex with animals. This is clearly condemned in the scriptures uh, and what the Bible has to say. Necrophilia, sex with dead bodies. And believe it or not, this is a sexual sin. That's not only happened in biblical times, but it even happens today. It's a, it's a disgusting sin. Pedophilia, which is sex with children, and then prostitution, which is called transactional sex. I do this for you if you do this for me. Does that sound familiar, husbands and wives? I do this for you if you do this for me. What is the difference other than the fact that you're not married to the individual and money's not involved? Or maybe it is. And so we cannot be taken captive by these sexual sins. We have to avoid these types of things. And so what does Paul clearly say in the scriptures about avoiding this type of sin? Well, like I said in the beginning, the first thing that we have to have is respect. Respect. You know, can I get a little respect for sex? You know what I mean? I know all of you are like, this is so awkward. Rick was right. We are really uncomfortable right now. And it's true. You think it's fun for me to preach on this? No. It's awkward. I don't want to talk about this. But it, it's, it's necessary. We need to have a holy and an honorable attitude towards sex, and that's what he said. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be set apart. And this is the process of becoming like God. Yes, you as an individual can rejoice and celebrate in sex and be exactly like God designed you to be. I mean, think about it. God put stuff on your body that was for the simple fact of pleasure, of experiencing something that feels good. And that isn't wrong. That isn't dirty. Just because something feels good doesn't make it wrong. God has designed us to operate that way. But in our operation of feeling good, we need to be pure and wholesome. And so a person that doesn't have sex is, can be just as pure as a person who does have sex. Because purity is not defined by whether or not it feels good. Purity is defined by whether or not it's designed according to the word of God. And so the first thing that he instructs us to do is this, and this is the first key word that I want to focus in on this morning, is to avoid, stay away from. The Greek actually defines it like this, to have one thing by letting go of another, to gain something by discarding something. And so I think that's an interesting idea about avoiding sexual immorality, is that you're giving up something that hurts you for something that is beneficial to you. 
Giving up a damaged relationship of sexual sin for a good relationship of sexual holiness. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. So how much sexual sin can we have in our life? I mean, okay, let's say we're married and we're faithful and we never violate our wife or go outside of our marriage, but we just look at a little bit of porn on the side. You know, it's not really that big of a deal. Or how about this? We've been faithful to our husband for our whole life as a wife and we've honored him and we've loved him, but yet we use our body in an attempt to gain things and earn things. Whether it's he's the provider of the home and we can get money or we can get him to finally do something around the house. Not even a hint of sexual immorality. That means zero, none, nothing at all. That is the goal. That is the line in the sand. That is something that we are all striving for. I wish I could tell you up here on the stage this morning that I was the only sexually pure person in the room. But I'm not. There are things that I struggle with and that wage war against my heart and my mind. I am a dude. I'm a guy, right? I have testosterone. And there are sometimes things that I do wrong, and I've already admitted some of those things to you about my earlier life. But being sexually pure isn't just what about you can't do. It's about what you can do. And so the next word in our text, he says, not only avoid sexual immorality, but each person should control their body. It means to win mastery over to discipline yourself. It means to not sell yourself short of the best possible life, to lay a hold of true sexual purity. And so Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, when he talks about self-discipline. He says, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. In other words, I'm going to discipline myself in such a way that I honor God with my body so that when I share the gospel and I share the message with people, I won't disqualify myself. I mean, how can I preach to you a message from God and from his word if I am living in sexual sin? I can't. In fact, as we'll see later on, if I continue to live in that sexual sin, it will eventually lead me to a point where I walk out and reject God. And so we have to not only avoid certain things, but pursue certain things. And I think that this is an interesting point to talk about. Let's talk about homosexuality, for instance. The Bible is very clear that homosexual behavior is something that we should not do. And you could look at Romans chapter 1 if you want to read that, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and following. And it talks about men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women, and that this is a pagan passion that should not take place for for God's creation, for the Christian household. And so what do you have if you have an individual who has sexual feelings and desires, and he is literally, he or she is literally attracted to somebody of the same sex? They're not attracted to women, for instance, or they're not attracted to men. Can that person be saved? Can that person be a Christian? Could that person come worship at Seven Christian Church with us? Is that a possibility? I think so. Just like the man who is married to a woman and has heterosexuality that is running through his body of testosterone and every woman that walks by that's sexually attractive, he envisions himself wanting to have sex with her. I think a person like that can be saved as well. What it comes down to is controlling yourself. Just like the married man who needs to control his desires to have sex with women outside of his marriage, so too the person who struggles with homosexuality but does not engage in sexual behavior. You see, we are corrupted to the very core. I wish that my wife was the only person that I have ever wanted and desired to have sex with. I wish that I could see women walk by and whether they wear uh, nude clothing, illicit clothing, however you want to categorize it, and I wish that those instincts did not jump. I wish that's how it was, but I'm a fallen person. I'm trying to control my mind, control my body, discipline myself, and to the subjection of the Lord. And I expect somebody who struggles with homosexuality to to do the very same thing. I am not going to participate in my heterosexuality outside of marriage. That's what God designed me for. And I think the homosexual should have the same attitude that I realize that these are feelings that I have, that I I want to participate in, that are natural for me, but I am going to reject them and resist them as I pursue the holiness of God. And so that's why the Bible is very clear. 
homosexuals can be saved just like people who have had five divorces and come to the Lord. Just like people who are heterosexuals and come to the Lord. These are individuals who can be saved and who we should welcome into our church. Who should we invite and say, come to the cross. Come bid and die that we could live to the glory of God. And I'm going to read a few scriptures to you later on. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says this. Marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And so what kind of sex should we have? We should have the honorable kind. This adjective, honor, is used to describe jewels or stones. And think of it like this. Why is gold valuable? Why is gold valuable? Does it have some intrinsic value to it? Well, no, our culture has assigned value to gold. This thing is valuable because we like it. We like the way it looks. Now, when God looks at sex, God inscribes value to sex. It doesn't just come from us. And so sex should be valued more than jewels, more than precious stones. Peter says this when he talks about something that is valuable. He says, Christians are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. And so sex should be valuable. It should have the value that it has from God. And so the key phrase that I would focus in under this is that we need to put the significance back in sex. We need to approach sex with honor and value, and it is precious. We need to win mastery over our body and self-discipline it so that we can honor God. Now the next thing that we have to do is that we have to reject the lies of sex. Paul wrote in verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians, he, sh- he says, We should not engage in the passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And so this idea of having a passionate lust is to be a slave to it, to where you're operating like a mere animal. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You see a group of guys sitting down at the beach, a pretty girl walks by, and it is almost like instinct, right? If you're at the mall and you see a pretty woman walk by a group of guys, I mean, they are hounding on her like mere animals. And that's what the Bible says when it talks about passionate lust. He says these are pagans who do not know God. And the truth is, is that the doctrine of sex is being waged war against by our culture. A lot of you are probably uncomfortable by the fact that maybe homosexuals can enter the kingdom of God. But yet the Bible very clearly says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 and following that some of you, he says, were homosexuals, adulterers, liars, greedy, drunkards. And he says people like that can't inherit the kingdom of God. But then he shifts into this. But that's what some of you were. That's how some of you used to live. You used to go outside of your marriage. You used to have sex with the same sex as you. This is what you used to do, but you're not like that anymore. You don't get drunk anymore. You don't steal anymore. You don't lie anymore. You don't participate in homosexuality anymore. He says, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, how about this lie? This lie that attacks the the doctrine of sexuality. Love is love, so be with the person that you're attracted to. But yet Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, Do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, or idolaters, or adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. So we have one category here, sexually immoral. And it could be someone who's a heterosexual or a homosexual. It could be someone that's never even had sex in their entire life. But they're sexually immoral with pornography. How about this lie? I can look at the menu as long as I don't order. So lust in your heart as often as you want. I had a kid in my youth group and he was talking to his dad about um, his struggle with pornography. And his dad said, son, it is no big deal. Not that big of an issue. You can look as much as you want just as long as you don't order off of the menu. That is a lie. Sexual lust is a sexual sin. When you entertain adultery and premarital sex in your mind and you role play that movie and you never push stop. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of his body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Pornea, pornography, it is a sin that we should avoid. How about this lie? Test it before you buy it. 
You've heard that one before, right? Drive test it before you buy it. You need to experiment sexually to see whether or not it's going to work with this person. Do you see how messed up of a view that is on the value and the preciousness of an individual? That sex could actually be the determining factor of whether or not you're going to stay with a person. How low does that degrade a human being to? I mean, let's just say the sex is terrible in a marriage. You're honestly going to give up on someone because of that? That is absolutely false. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 says, But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than burn with passion. And so you've got individuals who live together and have sex together outside of marriage. Paul says if you find yourself in that state, it is better for you to get married than to live like that. Don't test drive it before you buy it. Commit to the person. Love the person. Honor the person. View them with the value and the dignity that God has imputed to them. Get a little uncomfortable, you know what I'm saying? How about this one? My, my spouse doesn't deserve to have sex with me. And this may be a little bit of a touchy one. Because women operate primarily now, not always, but off of their emotions. If they don't feel appreciated and valued, the last thing they want to give you is their body. Right? Right, women? Amen? I mean, isn't that the last thing you want to give up is to be physically intimate with your husband when you can't even stand to look at him? But yet your husband doesn't operate that way, right? He doesn't operate that way at all. (laughs) Unfortunately, it's the truth, man. And so we can have a sinful attitude towards sex, even in our marriage. And that's what this church at Corinth was battling against. They were depriving one another of sexual intercourse in a marriage. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, The husband, always starts with the husband, should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. Men, You've got to step up. You've got to love her and honor her and not use her as a means to your satisfaction. But likewise, husbands uh, should fulfill his duty and so should the wife to her husband. Verse 4, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. Of course, wives yield it to their husbands. I mean, how many wives have had sex with their husbands and that's the last thing that you wanted to do, right? But you do it, Why? Because you love your husband. You honor your husband. You know that your body is not your own. You know he's not seeking to captivate you and use you and abuse you. You just don't feel like it. You're tired. You've been with the kids all day. You're emotionally exhausted. And the last thing you feel like doing is having sex with your husband. Right? But yet, because of the beauty of a relationship, because you do love your husband, you submit to him. Well, how about husbands, for instance? You've been thinking about sex all week. Maybe you haven't had sex for a couple weeks, or maybe it's even a couple months, and you finally cannot take it. And you say, tonight it is going down. <laughs> and so you've, you've lined everything up, you've lit the candles, you've bought dinner, it's, you, you've just set the perfect example, right, of what a romantic night is going to be. And your wife comes home, and she knows. It is all over her face. She knows. She's like, man, this is the last thing that I want to do. I'm tired. I've just finally got the kids dropped off. Can we just take a nap together instead? And so so a husband sees his wife in that situation, and he says, you know what? I love my wife. I honor her. I respect her. It is her desires over mine. And often, husbands, when you approach your wives like that, you'll be surprised. You will actually be surprised that your act of selflessness can be the very thing that spurs your wife on to be intimate with you. And so you have this mutual exchange of love and respect. The husband is not using the wife. The wife is not using the husband or her body to manipulate him. And you've got two people who love and honor each other. That is God's design for sex. But look what he says in verse 5. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent. And for a time, right? For a time, agree together. Talk it out. Actually understand where you're coming from. Maybe she's hurt, and that's the reason why she doesn't want to have sex. Maybe he's hurt, and that's the reason why he's not pursuing you, Uh, wives. Maybe you've hurt him by being vindictive and saying mean things to him and putting him down and emasculating him to the point where he doesn't even want to be around you. I mean, these could be real issues of why the sexual tension in your relationship uh, is not even there. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
Don't go too long, husbands and wives, without being sexually intimate because Satan wiggles his little deception right in there and he'll take you captive. And next thing you know, you've got somebody looking at porn or having uh, an adulterous relationship or doing something destructive. And so this is what the Bible teaches. We cannot allow ourselves to use sex as a hostage manipulating tool. How about this one? God wants you to be happy, so leave that marriage if you want to. Just be happy. That's what our culture teaches us. It is the most quiet I've ever heard our auditorium, by the way. (laughs) It's so quiet. I'm so nervous right now. And so the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, To the married I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. Jesus said this, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. God doesn't want you to leave your marriage. Of course, there are things that do happen. Spouses do cheat on each other, and there is an exemption that the Bible gives. Although, of course, we at Severn Christian Church, we want marriages to be reconciled. We want marriages to be restored. Even if there is adultery that's been committed, we want the spouses to come together and overcome that. And we do have some victories in this congregation of people coming together after something terrible like that and, and bringing themselves back together under the restoration of God. But we also have people who it didn't end so well. I mean, we have people in this auditorium right now who are unmarried, who have been hurt by someone who's committed adultery on them. Or, on the other hand, maybe that person has been the adulterer and their their spouse has left them. But at the end of the day, Paul writes, and you can read 1 Corinthians 6, 7, and 8. He talks about, here's the situation in which we are. Let's do the right thing from this point forward. And so maybe you've got a lot of damage. Maybe you've got a lot of hurt. Maybe you've been wronged or maybe you've done wrong. The point is, is that today is the day that you can pursue righteousness in your sexuality. And so if I could focus in on an idea, it would be this. True life is gained by being sexually righteous, not having sexual rights. Being sexually righteous, pursuing God, this moment, today. Today is the day where you can be poor and free. Today is the day when your marriage can be restored. Today is the day when you guys can go home, husbands and wives, or maybe even if you're single, and you can pray to the Lord, and you can seek out his will for your life. Back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says in verse 6, And that in this matter no one should be wronged, or no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all of those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. And so we need to remember that sexual disobedience can lead to disbelief. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins. And yet he adds this, he adds this. This is the God who gives you his Holy Spirit. God is going to deal with sexual immorality. And we shouldn't take advantage of people or cheat them or or try to gain something at their expense. But at the same time, we need to stand firm on our own lifestyle, making the right choice. You see, ultimately, our salvation is at stake when it comes to our sexuality. And we can live our lives in such a way that leads to disbelief. I can't tell you how many young men I have ministered to in youth ministry and even now who we've prayed for God to give them someone that they could have in a relationship uh, that goes on to be a spouse, a boyfriend, or girlfriend, And they end up leaving the Lord. After they have prayed and dedicated themselves to following after God, they get in a relationship and they leave God. Disobedience, sexual sin, that can lead to disbelief. This is the most important part. And this is what we're concluding with. Is that even though we've got sexual lies in our culture, even though who knows what kind of sexual struggles you have in your own life, God restores sinners who commit sexual sin. And this is a hallelujah victory for me, and this is probably a hallelujah victory for all of you. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, and we read this one already, but I just want to remind us of this. Do you not know that the wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanderers or the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then this is so beautiful, favorite verse in this passage. And that is what some of you were. He's writing to this church at Corinth. Some of you used to have sex with men. Some of you used to be a liar and a swindler and a slanderer and adulterer. Some of you used to cheat on your spouse. This is what you used to do. This is the behavior you used to have. But that's not what you are now. That's not what you should pursue. You were washed, he says. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And verse 19 says, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You were purchased. You were bought. One of the scriptures that I think about, about being purchased, is the book of Hosea. And if you do anything today, right, if you, if you want to read a little bit more about how God feels about you, if you've committed sexual sin, go read the book of Hosea. We know the Bible clearly teaches that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the Bible says that the Lord owns everything in the earth. Everything is his. Can you imagine paying money for something that is already yours? I mean, think about that. Think about somebody taking repossession of your house or your car or your clothing, and then they make you buy it back. Well, that's exactly what the Bible teaches, that even though God owned everything, God came down and he sacrificed his own body and he purchased us all back. Hosea married a woman at the instruction of the Lord. It's it's Hosea chapter 1, all the way throughout that entire book. Hosea married a woman who was caught up in prostitution. And God told Hosea, and this is, I take it to be a historical account, God told Hosea, the prostitute is Israel, Hosea, you are me. And he says, I want you to go marry this woman. And they end up having three children, and a lot of scholars believe that these were three illegitimate children, that even in her marriage covenant with Hosea, she went outside of that relationship, her name was Gomer, and she ended up having three children that were not his. Hosea loved her, took care of her, was still her husband, pursued her, and loved her. And it says in chapter 3 of the book of Hosea, that Gomer ended up selling herself back into prostitution. Can you imagine that? Here she has this man who loves her, who's pursued her, who's honored her, who's taken care of kids that he's not even sure are his own, and she sells herself back into prostitution. And in Hosea chapter 3, Hosea realizes this, and the word of the Lord comes to Hosea, and God says, Hosea, go and find her. Can you imagine what that journey was like? You go down to the places that no spiritual man of God should go. You're going down to the place where they sell prostitutes. And you know what you're going to find. You're going to find Gomer standing up on a pedestal, wrapped up in chains, selling herself again at prostitution. And you go up to the man who owns your wife and you say, Sir, that's, that's my wife. She, she's mine. She's mine. And the the slave owner says, I don't really care who you think she is. She's mine, and I'm selling her. And so the auction begins, and somebody starts out with one shekel, and then someone says two. And then it goes on to say, Hosea, God says to Hosea, I want you to buy her back. And verse 4, it says this, just like the love of the Lord. And so here's Hosea being a picture of God with Israel. That his own wife has sold herself back into prostitution. Hosea buys her back. Fifteen shekels of silver is what he paid for her. His own wife. And friends, that is a picture, and I hate to tell you this, that is a picture of us and God. We are the prostitute up on the pedestal being sold at a buyer's price. And God comes along and he purchases back that which he already owned just like the love of the Lord is what the Bible teaches. All of us in this room are guilty of sexual sin. I don't care who you are. Even if you've never had sex in your life, you've probably been guilty of sexual sin. But yet, God restores sinners. You're not too far gone. You're not at the end yet. 
You can be redeemed. You can be saved because you've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. And so I don't care if you've been the worst prostitute or the nastiest homosexual or the worst married individual who's cheated on your wife or husband five or six times. You can find redemption and forgiveness in the eyes of the Lord. And he can buy you back so that you can be his. The Bible is very clear. Go and sin no more. And so we're going to offer this time. It's going to be our, our time of offering an invitation. And if you've been living outside of the, of the realms that God has instructed you to live, if you've had a broken marriage, if you have done things that you know you shouldn't have done, we're going to invite you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. We're going to invite you to repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus and be baptized in the name of the Lord. And so I'm going to ask that you stand and you pray with me. And if you want to accept Jesus this morning, you can do that. God, we love you and we thank you for your word and your truth. And God, it is such a difficult message to share on because it's a sensitive one. It's one that is very personal to many of us in here. God, many of us have been hurt, have been forsaken, have been abused. God, many of us need healing. And so, Father, we thank you for being our ultimate healer. We thank you, Lord, for being our husband, our true spouse, who is forever faithful. God, I pray for everyone in this room who has been hurt, who feels like there is no hope. God, I pray that they will turn to the gospel, they will turn to the light, and they will find healing and a new hope to live by. So, Father, we pray over this offering now. God, we pray that this money will be blessed, that we can save people from the sin of sexuality, uh, the dirty sex that is out there in our culture, and that we can stand up for the truth, Lord. God, I pray that you will just encourage us and strengthen us to be the people that you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.